Hi, my name is Charlie Majorana, and I'm a sculptor and artist who loves to just play around in my art studio with tools, techniques, and materials. This video is a supplement to my book, Puttering Around the Art Studio, which contains all my best ideas and techniques and is available from Amazon. I've included a link below if you might be interested in getting a copy. You need to be aware that the way I make my artisan tiles is still evolving and what I'm demonstrating in this video is just a little different than the technique I included in the book, especially concerning the way I make and apply my impression masters that's changed. This video contains a complete detailed tutorial on how I design and make my raised line artisan tiles. I'll cover my design process, the clay and glazes I use, how I prepare the clay body, the way I make my impression masters, how I make and dry the tiles so they come out flat, the bisque firing I use, my approach to glazing and the glaze firing I use. I am self-taught and tile making is only a small part of my art interest. So I'm not claiming that the techniques I'll be demonstrating are the absolute best. This is just the way I do it. There seems to be as many styles of artisan tiles as there are folks creating them. And raised line is just one basic style. This particular style is instantly recognizable by the small raised line of ceramic between solid areas of glaze color. I make what are called low fire tiles which somewhat limits the tiles I make to plaques, indoor murals, and general decorative use, as opposed to being suitable for use in a bathroom or kitchen or outdoor works. Because of the raised lines, this style of tile is definitely not suitable for applications that get abrasive wear, such as floor tiles. The raised lines are not only a strong design element, they make applying the glaze quite easy without the use of resists or other techniques for keeping the glaze colors separated. This style of tile seems ideal for multicolored bold designs without coloring subtleties. The technique that I'll be showing you is meant for making multiples of a design, but actually I also use it when I am making one-off tiles. Most of the tile murals I have ever created have used this very technique, even though the tiles in these murals are usually one of a kind. As you will see in this video, I make these tiles by pressing a rubber impression master containing an outline of the design into the soft clay, which is the reverse of what you would do with a rubber stamp. I used to make my impression masters by carving the design outline into a rubber carving block using simple linoleum cutters, which is a lot easier than you might think. I've recently switched to making my impression masters using no odor rubber engraved on a laser engraver. I use commercial glazes for the tiles and you'll see that I apply the glazes using an air pen. I do not mix any of my own glazes and I did not use a bulb applicator for applying the glaze. If you want to learn more about the air pen, I suggest you check out my YouTube video, Acrylic Painting Using an Air Pen. The bane of all artists and tile makers is tile warping. And when I was first starting out, I created an embarrassing number of potato chip shaped tiles. Over the years, I have probably tried every approach to making perfectly flat tiles that I have ever heard about. I attended a tile festival a few years back and the one question I asked every tile maker I talked to was how they achieved flat tiles. While I didn't learn any single deep secret, I did learn that all makers struggled at some point with this problem. Now I have not perfected a technique that works all the time, but if you follow my method, most of the tiles you make will be acceptably flat. The technique I use is a melding together of everything I've learned about this issue.
Most of the designs that I create are not subtle, nor do they usually contain a lot of detail. My approach starts with using the EasyDraw application to create a line drawing on my computer. I use 0.06 inches for all the line widths, as I found that this yields nice lines once impressed into the clay. Here is the basic design I'll be using today during the demo. The outline around the design is not part of the tile and is just included as a rough guide for trimming the tiles to their final size. I currently use a tile cutter to actually establish my final cut lines and these cut lines are just inside this outline. One thing to remember when creating a design is that clay shrinks a fair amount during the drying process. This shrinkage varies with the clay body you have chosen. But if you want to be exact, you'll need to fire a measured sample of the clay you're using first. The low fire clays I use seem to shrink about four to five percent when fired to cone 06. So I start off with a six and a half inch square design, which gets trimmed down to six and a quarter inches by the tile cutter in order to end up with a, the approximate six inch square tile I'm looking for. I currently use a CNC laser engraver to engrave my impression master using a no odor rubber sheet. In the demo, I'm using a BMO 30 watt laser at medium resolution, speed 2.95 inches per second, 50% power, and two passes. And this is what the resulting impression master looks like. For making tiles, I use a sculptural mix containing a coarse grog, as this makes the clay much less prone to warping. Most often I use either mass white SS earthenware clay or mass red terracotta that I buy online from Sheffield Pottery and have been pleased with the results from both. I try to create tiles approximately 3 8 inch thick as I found that thinner tiles seem to be more prone to warping and half inch tiles seem a little thick for my taste. I do own a slab roller but have found it just as convenient to use a large rolling pin that rides on, on a plywood board that has wood strips attached to its side. The strips of wood are sized to give me the net 3 8 inch thickness of tiles that I prefer. Because I roll out the slabs directly onto one foot square pieces of Hardy Becker board, the strips of wood in this jig are the thickness of the Hardy Becker board plus 3 8 inches. Note that the Hardy Becker board has a smooth side and a side with a grid embossed into it, and you need to be sure to only use the smooth side. I put a mark on the embossed side to help me keep them straight. I use a dusting of talc, which is available from pottery supply houses, as a release to keep the clay from sticking to the board and the rolling pin. Breathing talc powder is very bad for your health, so be sure to wear a mask if you use it. After rolling out the slab, I rib both sides as this seems to help release a bit of the internal stress in the clay. In any case, you'll want to minimize the clay being handled too much as this is one of the culprits responsible for warping. Notice that I use a second piece of Hardy Becker board when I flip the slab over. I impress the design into the slab by placing the rubber impression master on top of the slab and gently rolling it with a two inch brayer. I've tried a number of other techniques such as tapping with a rubber mallet, 
but uh, the brayer technique is simple and works quite well. To cut out the tile, I first push a tile cutter about three quarters of the way down to create a groove, remove it, and then run a large pizza cutter around the created groove. I do not cut all the way through the slab with the tile cutter because by using talc, the clay doesn't stick to the hardy backer board and the tile cutter would lift up the tile. Before I owned a tile cutter, I just used the pizza cutter around the outer edge of the design, but using the tile cutter makes the tiles more uniform. Once you have impressed the tile, the next step is drying. The first step in this process is to place another piece of hardy backer board lightly on top of the tile, creating a sandwich. Because I'm drying the tiles between two pieces of hardy backer board, I don't add any additional weight on top of the sandwich. If I'm making a small run of tiles and have room on my drying rack, I do not stack these sandwiches. But if I run out of space on my drying rack, I will go a max of too high. If you go higher, you run the risk of squashing the design. On average, it takes a full week for the tiles to be bone dry. Just a note about my kilns. I have both a small sample kiln that I use for learning and experiments and a larger kiln when I want to fire a production quantity of tiles. The sample kiln has an electronic controller, but the production kiln I use is an oldie but goodie that uses a mechanical kiln sitter. One advantage of my production kiln is that it is large enough to hold tile racks. For the purposes of this demo, I will be using the small kiln but for real production runs, I load, I load and use the larger kiln. Each tile I create goes through two kiln firings, a bisque firing to convert the very fragile, dry greenware into a durable, semi-vitrified porous stage where it can be safely handled during the glazing and decorating process, and then a second firing to melt the glaze and fuse it to the tile. This initial bisque firing also helps the clay accept the glaze. It is really important that the bisque firing is done when the tile is bone dry and not cold to the touch to minimize the chance of the tile exploding in the kiln. During bisque firing, the tiles can touch each other and can even be stacked on an edge. However, during glaze firing, the tiles must be separated so that any flowing glaze does not inadvertently glue two tiles together and ruin both tiles. Before loading the bisque firing, I check each tile carefully for warping and sharp edges. I break any warp tiles into chunks and put them into a covered pail with water where they will eventually dissolve down into slip. Dealing with sharp edges is simple. Just a quick brush with a Scotch-Brite pad or dampened sponge will soften them. I use low fire clays and glazes and fire both the bisque and glaze firings to cone 06. I'm lazy and I use the built-in slow bisque and slow glaze programs when I'm using the sample kiln. The firing sequence I follow when using my production kiln for both bisque and glaze firings is First hour, lid cracked open and the kiln on low. Second hour, lid closed, kiln still on low. Third hour, kiln on medium. Fourth hour onward, kiln on high until the desired temperature is reached, which usually takes about four to eight hours or so. After this point, I turn off the kiln and allow it to cool. After 12 hours, I crack open the lid a small amount to allow the tiles to continue cooling down. I unload the kiln 
when the tiles are just a little warm to the touch. I take a very simplistic approach to glazing. A number of years back, I visited a large pottery supply house, looked at a number of commercial glaze sample boards, and picked out the series of colorful glazes I liked the most. For my aesthetic, this was the Mako Stroke and Coat line of glazes, and I've been happy with this choice so far. For reference in my studio, when planning a color scheme and when ordering the glazes, I bought the sample board for this line of glazes. Instead of buying a sample board, you are really better off getting a printed copy of the brochure. As sample boards, while nice, get out of date as new colors and variations are added. I've included a link to the Stroke and Coat online PDF brochure below, but you can request a printed copy directly from Mako to see better color representations. Instead of a bulb applicator or other glaze dispensing device, I use an air pen to apply the glaze. I also use the point of a wooden skewer stick to nudge the glaze into tight corners. To help the glaze flow and adhere better, I wet the tile by spraying with water prior to glazing. Now, normally, I'd be doing a batch of these at the same time, not a single tile, and I'd fill in like all the red on all the tiles first, and then move on to the next color. Now, I'm showing you the glazing process speeded up just so that you don't get bored, but normally it would take me about 10 minutes to completely uh, glaze one face of one tile.
Now, once you apply um, the coat of glaze, you're only really half done. If you were to fire it at this point, the colors would be very, um, they wouldn't look very good because you need at least two coats to get a complete opaque covering. This is what the tile would look like with just a single coat of glaze. When I use my sample kiln, I just use the pre-programmed slow glaze firing schedule set for code 06. When I use my production kiln, I follow the same firing sequence for glazing that I do for bisque firing, with the exception of the temperature I'm trying to reach. The other big difference is that during glaze firing, you must make sure that the tiles aren't touching, and I fire the tiles flat. So here's the completed demo tile, finally. Um, it's had two coats of glaze. I do wait a short time between the coats, uh, just enough time so that the glaze, uh, the first coat of glaze dries. If you have any questions about any aspect of my technique, just leave them in the comments below and I'll try to respond. Thanks for watching my video and remember to give me a thumbs up if you liked it. Also hit the subscribe button and bell to be notified when I post more videos in the future. I hope to see you next time.